Hello and welcome to our web talk, Making the EU Sexy, the, EU, the European Elections on Social Media. So in this Hangout, we'll be talking about what candidates are doing to make their campaigns more appealing for voters on social media. I'm Chipana Chimbelu and I'll be your host for this Hangout. And our guests today are the following people. We have Rick Mendez, who is with EU Watch in Brussels. And this is an organization that is actually also working on collecting all the tweets related to the elections using the main hashtag EP2014. So hi, Rick. Hello. Hello, everyone. And, all right. We also have then Niels Henders, man. He is a um, social democrat here in Germany, and he hopes to be maybe part of the EU parliament very soon. Hi, Niels. Hello. All right. Uh, next up is Martin Fuchs, uh, an, e an election analyst, actually, sitting in Hamburg. Uh, how are you doing, Martin? I'm fine. I'm on. All right. <laughs> And then back to back in Brussels, we have uh, Karolina Wozniak, who is a social media editor with the EU Parliament. Hello, Karolina. Hello. And last but not least of our guests, we have John Worth, an EU blogger, and he basically blogs about EU issues, including the elections. Hi, John. Hello from Berlin. So because we want you guys to take part in this Hangout, we will be expecting you to tweet about it and may maybe answer the questions, are these elections sexy enough for you? And you can answer that using the hashtag DWWebTalk on Twitter. And we will have our social media editor, Anne-Sophie Brendlin. Uh, she'll be looking at your comments on Twitter. Hi, Anne-Sophie. Hi, that's right. I'll be looking at your tweets, and I will raise this awesome sign here if I have any good questions from you guys, and I'll be sure to forward them to you. All right, so this is promising to be a rather exciting hangout. I mean, we're talking about the EU elections, something that's supposed to affect everyone living in Europe and also the rest of the world. Um, but first up, we have this video. This is an ad. An ad tries to tell you what to do. But this ad wants you to tell us what to do. Use that power and choose who's in charge. Vote from May the 22nd to May the 25th. The European elections, May 2014. That was a video from the EU Parliament's YouTube channel. And um, I'd like to ask all of, all of our guests, um, was that video appealing enough for voters out there? If you think it was appealing, please raise your arm. <laughs> right, so we have support <laughs> from the EU Parliament itself. <laughs> Carolina says yes, but the rest of our, of our guests don't think so. So maybe I'll start with John Worth. Why would you say that wasn't appealing for voters? Well, I, I think that's a little bit too harsh. Obviously, the European Parliament has to do that kind of public information campaigning. The difficulty is, is how many people are going to see such an advertisement, uh, the amount of money which is paid in, in, in doing so. I understand why the European Parliament has to make such films, but I don't think it's going to make that much difference to how many people are actually going to go and vote in the European elections, either positively or negatively. Martin, you also said no. I mean, uh, you just heard what John said. Uh, would you agree with his opinion? And would you be able to tell us what you think was wrong in that video? <laughs> I think the video is perfect. It's very cool uh, style, very cool stuff there inside, and the cool optic. Um, and uh, if I like to see this, uh, maybe it's uh, it's for me a motivation to go to a white vote, but. Um, I think a lot of the European people don't see the video because it's only a YouTube account of the European Parliament or uh, on the campaign account, but nobody goes there. Nobody goes to the account to look at this video, to watch the video. And so I think they don't reach the, the people with this video. And so I think that's not effects for the campaign or for the um, uh, for the, that the people going to the world vote. Well, Martin, if I would just interrupt you, I, I was on YouTube earlier today watching another video, and that ad did appear. So I think the EU Parliament, and Carolina, you can correct me or not, is actually paying um, YouTube uh, some money, I guess, for people to see that ad. Is that correct? Or is there some sort of partnership? Uh, we are doing a promotion of the video to make sure we reach people with it. It's not only on our YouTube channel, it's also shown uh, by different broadcasters. It's on our 
different media channels, uh, social media channels on Twitter, on uh, Google Plus, on uh, Facebook as well, because we try to reach with it uh, as many people as possible. It uh, exists not only in English, but in all languages, including some, uh, for example, other languages like uh, Catalan. So we're trying to make sure that people can understand the message uh, in their own language, and we want to reach as many people as possible. But this is not the only product that we have. We have specific products, for example, for young people um, on other videos. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Carolina. It was just uh, it was just to set our conversation and discussion going, and uh, maybe just to kind of get a sense of what is being done out there. Um, I mean, because if you compare it to some of what maybe was done over the weekend with Eurovision, you can't compare in the amount of social media activity going on with the EU elections compared to say something like Eurovision or even sports for that matter. So, even if the EU does affect our lives, it seems people are not you know, really getting into it as much, at least not on social media anyway. And maybe I should turn to Niels now. Um, what are you doing exactly as a politician to engage your voters uh, on social media? Well, first of all, uh, I think that social media, especially for the European elections, has a lot of advantages because uh, it seems to that the European level is a bit uh, further away from um, the real life of people and uh, social media helps to bring our policies closer to the people um, and make decisions uh, which are made in Brussels far away from the real life sometimes a bit more um, interesting for people. But it's hard. Um, you have to have followers. You have to have, of course, a Facebook account, a Twitter account and so on. But I also see that there's... Um, not that much of interest if you are uh, just starting as a new candidate and not being elected yet because uh, it's hard to find more than the normal people within the party to join your Facebook account, to join your, um, to follow you on, on Twitter. Um, but of course this is uh, uh, the part of the campaign uh, to bring more people to, to listen what uh, the ideas of uh, social democrats are about and especially what my um, policy will uh, look like uh, if I'm elected and um, so uh, this is this is the main task now in the campaign to bring more people also following me on, on social media. Yeah, well, um, it's interesting what you say because obviously you're talking of the general a social democrat in Germany. Um, Rick Mendes, you are Portuguese. Of course, you're sitting in Brussels, but I'm assuming you are observing what's going on in Portugal as well. Do you think the experience there is slightly different from what's taking place here in Germany? Is the debate on social media different or even how candidates are inter interacting with uh, voters? Well, um, <clears throat> I, th I think the situation on social media is very different in, on each European country. Um, uh, not only social media in general, but also networks. So, for example, some countries will have a presence, a natural presence on Facebook or, or other social network much more elevated than Twitter. Uh, Twitter is still seen, uh, in my opinion, for, uh, you know, general people as a very specific tool uh, that has a reputation to be targeted to journalists or politics or, uh, you know, people that are in some way um, following very specific events like sports events or political events but very specific issues and uh, I'm not sure that there is the same amount of people on Twitter that there is naturally on Facebook. Um, so I think for Portugal for example I don't think that um, Portuguese citizens are watching the elections uh, via Twitter uh, and since the national media are doing, in my opinion, a very poor job on reporting about Europe, not only the full year, the, the, the whole year, and during the whole, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole legislature, um, this is not happening. Uh, so suddenly there is the election, and suddenly national TVs have to do something about it because otherwise you have the kind of scandals like you have in France of uh, the public broadcaster not. Uh, not uh, going through with the with the with the candidates about to the European Commission uh, on public TV. So you have this kind of of problems uh, in different European countries. Um, social media in some countries, like Spain, for example, I would say uh, France, Spain, and the English uh, in general are the the three more uh, present uh, inside the EP fourteen two thousand fourteen uh, hashtag. Yeah, maybe we should turn we should turn to John Worth because obviously you sort of have a 
an EU-wide view and you are British yourself. So have you noticed a very different debate going on in the UK? I mean, of course, there, there is the discussion of them maybe potentially leaving the EU one day. At least maybe next year there might be a referendum. So um, could you just comment about what kind of debate is it more intense and are candidates actually also making use of social media in a different way? Yes, the UK debate is extremely intense, it must be said, um, but it's not necessarily very well informed or indeed very well informed about the European elections per se. It's a wider debate about kind of in or out of the European Union. Um, so that's the challenge in the UK is that the debate is focused very, very strongly around Britain's relationship with the European Union, not the European Parliament elections itself. In terms of different countries and their use of social media and how candidates are using it, Twitter is very, very active in British politics and it's much less active in German politics as I see it from my own personal point of view. And this depends a little bit on the development of each individual country. Um, other countries, for example, like Netherlands, have an extremely interesting uh, Twitter environment in politics. Um, so it depends on the individual national environments, which tools work best. I think the advantage of Twitter for the European Parliament elections is it allows that transnational debate to happen to a certain extent, an issues-based debate to happen. And having either of those things on Facebook is much, much harder. I think the candidates that use Facebook very well are candidates that want a deep engagement with their own party supporters, with their own people who are kind of in their own environment already, and a deeper engagement with those. If you wish to debate something widely across the entire political system, then that's uh, where, where Twitter comes into its own. Um, we have at least seen, even in environments where Twitter has not been so important until now, Denmark, for example, some kind of increase in the use of Twitter in recent months, partly motivated by some candidates in the European elections using Twitter intensively there. Right. Well, thanks. Um, I just saw from Anne-Sophie that we have a comment or a question from social media. So, Anne-Sophie, can you just tell us what that is? Yeah, actually we have quite a few comments, but one of them was about what uh, Niels Hindersman said before, that he's using, using more and more social media to interact with um, voters. And we have one question, let me show it to you, on Facebook. Um, Ivan Burroughs says, EU politicians don't interact on social media, their interns do it for them. So here's my question, is that true or are you actually posting yourself? Well, uh, I'm posting myself. I don't have an intern. I have people also to help me in the campaign, volunteers, but um, uh, they will also sometimes uh, post something on, on Facebook, but my uh, Facebook page and my Facebook account, I still uh, do my posts myself. Right. Um, maybe we should ask Carolina that as well, because obviously you your work sort of involves also um, current MEPs, some of whom may be uh, campaigning. Do you happen to know whether most of the MEPs are using Facebook and Twitter themselves or whether they have a team doing that for them? Uh, in our work, we are the central administrative account, so we are not doing any work for the MEPs. They're doing this on their own. We know uh, how many of them are on Twitter and Facebook, but we don't know how they do it, uh, how they organize their work. So on this question, I cannot help you. All right. Well, it's I, I can tell uh, that when we do chats with them, it's actually them sitting and typing uh, or talking with people during a hangout. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, obviously, uh, I can... uh, maybe what we can go on to now is maybe maybe ask if there's any candidate who is using social media in their campaign very effectively. Is there any candidate out there? Um, Martin, do you know of any candidate who is doing that? Yes. And John told uh, in his comment before that uh, not so a lot of many John uh, use social media at its best in, in the campaign or in the work as an MEP. Um, but one or two guys uh, I like to recommend, and one is uh, young Philip Albrecht. It's from the Green Party. It's a very young guy. I think it's the youngest MEP from Germany as well. And he has, has the, the magic of social media and understand the culture behind. Because he uses online and offline between. And he's not an, an offline guy to, to, to use um, half an hour a day the online things. And then uh, uh, 23 hours uh, on the offline guy. And uh, he knows if he on the online, he has to be um, motivate the offline guys. And when he is on an offline um, event, he uses uh, as, as normally the online uh, things. And, and then he, uh, he has, his advantages, he has only um, security and data um, issues um, um, 
and so it's, for him it's more easier uh, to uh, be in the uh, in the social media things because he is a net politician and so it's all of these net politician interested guys and, uh, and people are on the uh, internet and so he reached him better than a, a, a guy who is on the focus on the environmental things or on the financial things. Yes. Right. Um, so basically, he does interact with voters. So I mean, from what we see on the like on different levels and different countries, I know it's really complicated with the EU. But um, in terms of candidates, are they interacting more, or are they broadcasting just their views and policies, and then you know they just leave people to retweet that and do whatever with that information? Um, maybe John, you would be able to say what you've seen and observed on the EU level. Yes, I think we're seeing different patterns of development. Um, I'd just like to also add one other politician um, who's from uh, from Netherlands who's very good at using uh, using social media. That's uh, Marietje Schacher from D66, um, uh, a, a young politician who does who's already a member of the European Parliament who does lots of work about EU foreign policy. Uh, she's very much worth following. I think there's also the case that smaller political parties are maybe better at this than larger political parties in the main. There are obviously some exceptions. But a lot of liberals and greens are better in Brussels than uh, than social democrats and, uh, and 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 Christian democrats. And um, what I think is very important to say as well is, if you've been engaging with a politician over a period of time in social media, you can see which ones are the honest ones and which ones are the good ones, versus which are the ones that are just doing public relations on the, on social media. Um, I'd just like to point out, for example, a bad politician in Brussels, Vivian Redding, the European Commissioner. And we know that her account has been tweeting at the time she's been stood on her feet in the European Parliament, and she didn't have an iPhone in her hand when uh, when that was being those things were being written. Uh, so we can be pretty certain that's not actually her. Now I think if you are engaging with politicians on an everyday basis, you can see which of the sorts of ones that will be engaging and which ones are less likely to 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 reply and answer to. Uh, and that's the individual user's responsibility to work that out. What I think we're going to see uh, after the European elections is, is a higher number of uh, MEPs and indeed commissioners in Brussels who are going to have to be present on social media. The numbers are already quite high if you compare the party level to politics, and that will just rise still further. I think we're getting some some sound issues on your side. I don't know if it's the mic or the but we have an echo effect. Has that? Has everybody got an echo effect? Is everybody hearing an echo? Yes, he's hearing an echo. Right. So maybe uh, hopefully that will be itself. Uh, I have to go on. Um, where are we hearing that from? Uh, we can mute our microphone and see where this is coming from. Yeah, maybe it would be better to, to mute. Let's see. If, okay, sorry. Um, I think it's better. Uh, yeah. Okay, perfect. Then we'll just carry on now. Um, I was just going to pick up from where uh, John had left off of politicians. Like you had mentioned something about parties which are newer and younger using social media in a different way. And I was going to ask this question to Niels. Um, you're a social democrat, one of the oldest parties here in Germany. Do you think there's less of an incentive for a party like yours or for someone in a party like yours, which has a, a big member base here in Germany, to use social media? Do you think that you don't need to be on social media as much because you know that you do have voters um, in large numbers in Germany? Well, we used to have more voters, especially in national elections, so that means that we always try to find new voters and, of course, mobilize uh, people uh, to every election. And uh, there is a change, uh, what we can observe, and this is why um, also professional campaigners in our party are now spending more money, more budget on uh, social media and so on to uh, reach new target groups and to also interact with them. So that means that also we understood that there is a high potential and that we should use it a lot more. And um, But on the other hand, we still have a lot of members and of course also voters um, who are not so much online. And uh, maybe it's also because they live sometimes in rural areas where we don't have all this access to um, high-speed internet and so on, but they still expect from a candidate that uh, he or she is also presenting herself in real life and is uh, going 
um, to some uh, small village even and uh, to present himself and say, okay, that's me, I'm running for European Parliament and this and this are my polit is my political agenda. Um, and uh, the day only has 24 hours, so you have to decide on where you spend your, your uh, time resources, rather on social media or on real uh, activities with real uh, uh, voters where you interact in, in real life with them. But on the other hand, I know that uh, I have a lot of um, followers also on, on my Facebook uh, webpage and they also want to see from me uh, what I'm doing because they cannot be present at every event taking place uh, during the campaign. Uh, and so, I mean, you have to combine and try to combine both. And um, right. I'm very sure that, that it's important to reach also new uh, target groups and new voters uh, who are more affiliated to this uh, social media. Right. Um, I was just going to ask you quickly, uh, which one's more important, social media or the traditional campaign, Niels, for you? Which one's more important at this time because you, you are campaigning at this moment? So if you just tell us one or the other, which one are you focusing more on? Well, it... It, it's sort of balancing itself. So I would say it's it's 50-50. I mean, I really try to do a lot on Facebook and Twitter, but um, the, okay. the experts so. will probably say this uh, in a few minutes that my Facebook account and my Twitter account could be used more and that I could have more uh, followers. I know that. But um, the situation is that it's just me and some volunteers supporting me, so it's not that I have endless resources uh, put on that. So on the same time, I try to do and spend um, at least half of the time on uh, the professional and campaign and, and the campaign with, with the, um, yeah, in the traditional way. So that's, that's what's where I would say I do 50-50. All right. And uh, Rick, is that what you've observed as well? Is it a 50-50 situation for most people campaigning? It really, de really depends on the, on the political parties, in my opinion. You have, for example, the S&Ds have, uh, uh, it seems, some good teams doing a, a good job, uh, even at the European level. So if uh, Martin Schulz is going to Italy or different countries, uh, he will have different teams uh, you know, really working out on social media to, to put pictures, to put contextual information to what uh, Martin Jules is, is saying. So you have, um, you know, it's, it's really depending. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, we are far from uh, the U.S. Uh, level where social media was, uh, for example, for the, the Obama's campaign was a really, uh, um, a tool that was really, really important and data mining was also very important. Here in Europe, I don't think we have uh, the, the, the market, I mean, we, we don't have uh, the amount of citizens using the, the, the networks the same way in the US. So it's a, really something evolving and I think this one here is maybe an investment for many politicians, many political groups to actually invest more time and more energy on social media because on the next election I think it's going to be largely different from what we have today. All right. Um, maybe we should kind of turn into the last question because um, I, briefly maybe all of you could tell me, uh, or maybe before we do that, actually, um, I think we have a comment from social, from social media. I'm sorry about that. And <laughs> Sophie was there, and I, I didn't see her, but I have now. And uh, and Sophie can just tell us uh, what uh, has been said or asked on social media. Yeah, we're getting a lot of responses on the question whether getting in touch with voters by using social media is actually making them more sexy. Um, there is one comment on Twitter um, by the UK EPP that is saying social is an essential way for new parties like us like to that. connect with potential voters. Potential voters. And then on and Facebook, then on um, we have um, we have issues with um, um, you and Sophie. Are you? Uh, can you hear us fine or? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me fine? Can you hear an echo for everyone else? For everyone else. We'll have some difficulty. Have some. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Niels and. Um, Carolina, your mics, uh, just, yeah, okay. Uh, and so we can carry on? Sure, okay, so <laughs> I was just saying that we have a couple of comments. Um, one of them is by the UK EPP that is saying social media is an essential way for new small parties like us to connect with potential voters. And then on Facebook we have a comment um, by Yuri Yakushko who is saying nothing makes them, as in politicians, more sexy than being open and reasonable decisions. And then we have one comment that is saying the opposite by Nelson Andres Perez Rodriguez, who is saying no, in Latin America to interact with them is the same as to interact with delicates. Right. Uh, maybe I'll just 
take uh, something out of those comments uh, from <coughs> Anne Sophie. Maybe does social media make candidates appear more open and transparent? I, I this is just maybe briefly. If we could start with John, yes or no, with maybe a very 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 short sentence added to that. Uh, yes, if they do it themselves, yes. And then uh, Carolina. Uh, I don't want to judge the candidates, but I can tell you that, that it's very important for the parliament to make it transparent, and I think social media are helping uh, us with this. Okay, uh, Martin? Uh, Mike, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I think it, it's more uh, it's, it's the best way to open the, the parliament and, and, and the, the work of the politicians, but I think the trick is to have to understand the culture behind social media, and then it's the best way for transparency. Okay, uh, Nils. Yes, I think that is ha it's having a high potential to uh, bring the European level closer to the voters and the people. Okay, and finally we have Rick. Yeah, but definitely. I think it's uh, it's good if they do it themselves and if they are present. It's uh, it's uh, it's great to engage in more transparency. All right. So it's, it seems like doing it yourself makes a huge difference because obviously having interns or someone else doing it on your behalf uh, just makes you look a little bit um, not as trustworthy as someone who's sitting it, uh, there and doing it on their own. I do have also one question um, about how we can make um, social media more appealing, um, at least for in the, in the EU, because obviously the comparison is always with the United States and maybe a, little, a few other countries which in, in where, like where social media is really sort of taken the leap forward. Um, what's the one thing that you could do to make social media more exciting for voters um, in these elections or in the next ones? Because maybe the elections are way too soon to talk about that. Um, we'll start with um, Rick this time. Well, that's uh, that's a, that was my idea two years ago, was uh, how European elections are coming and how what can I do to first understand better how it's working, how Europe is working, how the parliament is working, and how and what can I do, because I'm a webmaster and I work on the web, what can I do to engage with people and then to, to try to, to have people to engage with the different uh, accounts. Uh, so that's a princ this is the principal reason why I started the watch was it's really trying to engage with people and trying to really put you know uh, common information from common people at the same level of of uh, of, uh, of tweets that are coming from recognized media institutions or MEPs or or whatever. So I wanted to to mix opinions, and uh, for me this was um, one way to do it. So also engaging with people is what you would say. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nils. I would okay. I would absolutely agree. Um, uh, I think that. All candidates should spend more resources, time, resources on social media to interact with their voters, and uh, this is what I will also see as the main task for my campaign. And so I know that I can improve there a lot, and uh, maybe we we'll see uh, how things go out uh, on the 25th of May. And um, maybe I will improve also my uh, social media presence uh, then uh, a bit more. All right, um, Martin. Uh, yes, I think Nils uh, talks for the right things, and uh, I think it's important to engage the, the people five or six days before the election is. I think it's very, very hard. I think the, the trick is that we have to engage the people four years before the election is. And it's, it's very hard now for Nils because he's the first time as candidate. Um, but um, if you are voted or if you are elected, then you have to start with the social media engagement for the next election. You have to engage people all the time and not only in the four weeks before the election is. Uh, and I think that's the hardest thing to engage people, not only in, in the campaign time, but all the time if you are a politician in, in the parliament. Right, so uh, continuity is important. Um, and Carolina, what would you say? What would that be? I think we will uh, continue working on the fact that people, uh, to make people aware of the fact that they can contact us through social media, that they can ask a question, they can uh, send us a comment, and th that we will respond. And uh, as it was said previously, it's not only during the election time, but also afterwards. Okay. And John, finally. 
Um, oh, we don't hear you. That was an error. Wait a minute. Now I'm unmuted. Now it's good. Um, no, I would say that social media can give everyday citizens a voice in European Union policymaking, uh, uh, not only at elections, but also in between times. Um, so that's be that contacting a member of the European Parliament or signing an online petition or blogging about the things that do or do not work in the European Union. So that's what I've been doing now for a number of years as a blogger about the EU, is kind of telling those stories, what does and does not work in the European Union, and trying to get those matters that are important to me out to a wider audience and to try to apply some pressure to some MEPs. Um, and uh, social media allows me to do that. So I'd encourage anyone with an internet connection to get involved, blog, tweet, post some questions on Facebook, um, because your voice can be heard in Brussels if you're organized enough and determined enough. All right. Um, thank you for the final words. So you heard that. If you want to get involved, get onto social media. And if you want to get involved and talk to us, get into so on social media and use that hashtag DWWebTalk because, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our Hangout, but we still want to hear from you, so do use the hashtag to join us. And I'd like to take this moment to thank all of our guests for joining us. Um, we really enjoyed this discussion. Um, for the rest of you out there, like I said, join us again. But you can also visit our Europe special on dw.de slash Europe 2014. Um, so hopefully we'll hear from you on social media. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.